So I was look, reading an article this morning about um, Melissa from Melissa and Doug. And because for a while I'd been wanting to look up and see like their statement about starting to sell plastic toys when they used to only sell wood. Um, and they sold the company in 2017. So that's what happened there. But seriously, since I had like bought a Melissa and Doug plastic toy in a Whole Foods like months ago, I had been like, oh, I got to look this up. I got to look this up. And I'm so happy I did because I came across this article in the Wall Street Journal about the founder, Melissa. And she described her childhood as like, as she was always really dark and, and it, she shared one of the poems that she had written when she was five years old, which is basically a suicide note. And like, I was literally the exact same way as a child. Like for as long as I can remember in my life, I was like, I gotta get out of this life. Like, I gotta get out of this life. This life is no good for me. And I tried to kill myself for the first time when I was seven by jumping off a roof. It did not go very well. And the thing about like, I've had a lot, so I've had four suicide attempts. Um, three of them involved jumping off of things. And because I never made the jump, I was like, oh, did these really count as suicide attempts? And then one time was taking pills. Now, and that one, did, came, that was how I got excommunicated from the cult, the children of God. You weren't allowed to leave until you were 18. So I tried to kill myself when I was 13, knowing that if I didn't die, then I would be excommunicated. And so I was happy, you know, as happy as I could be. But I had the urge. I was like, I got to get myself out of this cult. Um, but I tried to kill myself for the first time when I was seven, because I just did. I was like, there's nothing in this life for me. Like, it's just... I just don't understand what the meaning of it is. Like we used to fundraise by, you know, standing on the street corners asking for change. And like, I would see these children giving me these looks of pity. And I would, you know, we're like making balloon animals in a Walmart for a dollar and being like, why am I here? Why am I the, the kid asking for money? The kid making the balloons and these kids like they're, they're out shopping with their moms. Like, I've never been shopping with my mom ever, you know, like I, I just didn't understand like the, the outsider complex was, was huge, but I assumed that I was that way just because of, of how I was raised. And, and I do very much think that it was, you know, the, the lack of love in the family that I was born into a lot of like saying we love you, but with actions, just not being there. My parents just weren't around. And, and it was a very like, dis when your parents aren't around in your life, like no one else loves you. <laughs> no one else loves you the way that your parents do, you know, people will watch you and they'll tolerate you and stuff, but like, you're not their kid that unconditional love is meant to come from your parents. And if you, if you're born, if you're, if your parents didn't really love you, then like, yeah, you're gonna feel like, well, what's the point of this life? Because the point of life is, is love. And when you're born into a family where there's like no love given, then it, then it really, really fucks with you. Anyways, I, but I just assumed that like, I was the only person that I was like some unique case some like extra dark person and it was because of the chaotic way that I the the chaotic world that I was born into but reading about this woman Melissa Bernstein I think her last name is she um she was in a, a pretty normal home but she had this just complete lack of hope in in life and and the future so I was suicidal, like literally my whole life and suicidal in the sense where I considered it like probably every two or three days, like actually any time things didn't, when I woke up in the morning and I just didn't feel like going to my same job again, I'd be like, well, I could just kill myself. If I had a cavity, I would be like, well, I could just kill myself. And you know, if I had a phone belt, I could just kill myself instead. Like it was suicide was like a very reasonable, very warm option on my fucking burner all the time. It wasn't like, oh, some crazy thing happened. Now I'm really going to do it. It's just like, oh man, I'm just like waiting for that one thing to push me over the edge for real because like I'm so fucking ready like I'm over this every single day and the times when I did try to kill myself it wasn't like this breaking point of like I just can't take anymore it was more like that's it I'm fucking over this bullshit I'm done that's it it was it was more like a a tired resolve than like a dramatic ending anyways I so this lady they 
this lady, Melissa, what this started to grow up into in her life was like, you know, all of the, she, she became anorexic. She became obsessed with working out. I became bulimic. I became obsessed with working out. I became, well, more obsessed with like not eating too and, and drinking and being like just out and with somebody all the time. Um, I didn't really have anything that I did, just me. I just like couldn't be alone. From a chakra perspective, like hers were a lot more in the root chakra of, of control and trying to stabilize something. And mine were a lot more in the field of numbing and trying to numb a pain. And, and her, I, I don't know what her childhood was like apart from what I read in the article. Um, but those are usually related to the root chakra, the, the anorexia, the obsessive working out and stuff like that, the perfectionism. And it was a lot more about numbing for me, a lot more about just taking the pain away. And, and that was a result of, of a lot of sexual abuse that I had early on in my life. And so this woman spent basically her whole, you know, she started the company, Melissa and Doug, she, you know, tried to be a lawyer, but ended up starting Melissa and Doug with her husband. He had like six kids, but she was just like nonstop serving everybody else, never stopping and taking time for herself because she just didn't love herself, didn't see a point in loving herself. And I really uh, understood that. But anyway, she was diagnosed at like 60 years old with something that they call existential depression. And my first thought was like, oh, wow, maybe I have that too. And, and it's talking about how much better she's doing now. It's she's not different, but she's managing it. She's not different, but she's managing it through through therapy and um, through this diagnosis of existential depression they sold the company melissa and doug they started a company called lifelines which is now work uh, to to help people out with that but i was thinking oh maybe i have existential depression but then i realized that like this suicide has not been an option for me since one very 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 specific moment and it had nothing to do with therapy. Here's exactly what happened. In 2016, so in 2015, my fiance died when I was, and I was just like, my life just keeps getting worse. I had like a brief little moment of feeling like I can do it, I can change my life around. But then when I realized that business was not going to be handed to me, I was not gonna be rewarded for all of my suffering with a million dollars and a new career, like I was still gonna have to work really really hard at it like much harder than I ever would have expected much harder than I would have ever agreed to had I known how hard it was going to be in the beginning um but I in in 2015 like I couldn't be alone you know my fiance died I couldn't be alone I got engaged two times right within like six months after he died because that was just the level that I was at. Like it used to be enough to just have a boyfriend there, but like I needed a verbal commitment that they weren't going to leave me. Like my codependency was just like flying off the charts. Anyways, um, in 2016, I moved to my, I was like coming to the end of my credit cards. I moved to Toronto. I was living on the 30th floor of a high rise on John street, you know, in an Airbnb on a credit card. And I was fucking miserable. And my like fucking boyfriend, fucking AA sponsor loser guy that I was going out with, um, I was hitting like a rock bottom. And I'm just going to name this guy straight up. Dylan Bowden, you're a fucking cocksucker. And your homies too. But he, I went over to his house because I was like really, really struggling with like an all time low. I was like fucking really low and a crying hyperventilating and I just needed I was like I, you know I, I can't be alone I'm gonna I'm gonna kill myself um I went over to his house and while I'm there like panicking and, and hyperventilating he's fucking eating fried chicken and takes his dick out and starts trying to make me jerk him off while I'm literally like in a state of panic then he starts trying to get on top of me and fuck well and I'm like what the fuck is wrong with you p.s you know, weren't you like best friends with the fucking, with my fiance that just died? Like, what is any of this in the first place? But also like, why are you trying to fuck me right now? And I was like, no, get the fuck off of me. And he was like, fuck you. You're crazy. You're fucking crazy. Like following me out into the street, 
saying I'm crazy for saying no to him while I was like mid panic attack, but it cracked into some repressed ass memories. I lost all like nobody in none of my friends there. Like I told people what happened and they were basically, I just felt like everybody took his side. So I said, all right, fuck this. I went to Greece on a trip trying to be friends with these fucking chicks who were just not, who were just bitches anyway, jealous of me. I didn't even know, you know, like I know now what that taste is, but had a horror, had a vacation that went very, very wrong, spent way too much money that I didn't even have, went back to Toronto, was still trying to be a life coach, shaved my head, was fat and just rock bottom and and I didn't have any friends in Toronto this time when I went back because of that thing that had happened with that guy and and I just felt like there was nobody I could talk to I was just so bummed I was just so bummed so every day for like 30 days I tried to kill myself uh the 30 days that I was there um and I was actually there a bit longer I was there for two months um but I would go and I would sit on my balcony and just be like I'm just, I'm going to jump off. But the only thing that I could ever, I would have to sit out there for so long, you know, just dreaming of like how there would be nothing, that no more waking up to me again after the splat. <laughs> and I was like so relieved. Um, but someone had told me when I first got to Toronto that I should see someone named Mina the Psychic and I was like all right well you know I basically don't have any more money but you know we'll see and every day I would plan this suicide and then finally one day I was like literally at the at the end of my money so I said okay this is this is it I said this is what I'm gonna do I'm gonna go get one more cup of coffee see if I can find any reason to live and one more cup of coffee goodbye cruel world and and that'll be it I was already there was nobody to say goodbye to there was nobody to write a suicide note for there was nobody that fucking honestly there was nobody that fucking cared about me my phone never rang everyone knew that my boyfriend had just died Nobody fucking called me. No, but literally nobody cared. Nobody came to check on me. Nobody asked me if I wanted to hang out. Nobody cared. And, and I was over it. And I was like, and I didn't even care at that point anymore. Anyways, I was sitting on my balcony and I see across the street, the same fucking place where I had looked every single day. There was a purple sign in the window that I had never seen before that said, Mina the Psychic. I was like, what? This fucking psychic right across the street from me? Right across the street from me? But I said, well, whatever. Fucking too late now. Not, you know, I don't even have any money to go to a psychic, even if I wanted to. I'm going to go get my last cup of coffee with my, like, you know, $4 that I have. And I was walking to the coffee shop, same coffee shop, same route that I walked on every single day. And there was a purple sign again, this time a sandwich board that said Nina the Psychic. And I was like, oh, well, you know, maybe it's a sign, but I still didn't have any money. Anyways, I, I think at the time I had sessions up for sale on my website. And while I was getting a cup of coffee, a PayPal thing came through. It's like $111. Uh, somebody had bought a session with me on my website. And like, I think it was like a health coaching session or something that I offered at the time. I don't know. It was very rare for people to fucking buy my services at all. Um, but now I had something to, I had a, a, I could either return the money to them and be like, I'm killing myself today. No, thank you. Or I could do this session with the person the following day. And now I had money. So I was like, well, I'll go and see the psychic. So I went and I knocked on the psychic door on the way back and this like very like thin little gay man like, hello <laughs> I was like hi are you Mina and he's like no I'm Christian her brother I was like oh okay and like made up some bullshit to to leave because I was like you know I'm not gonna go see Christian the psychic but the next day I went to go and check it out and he was there again and this time I was like well I you know I actually want to do it and 
he was, I was like, how much is a session? And he was like, oh, it's $120. And I was like, fuck, fuck, fuck all. Can I pay you with a credit card? It's like, no, cash only. And I was like, all right, well, let me go see. Because I didn't have that much in my account. But I was like, I will go try and take $120 out of the ATM. And if I do, I'll go spend it on this psychic. And so I did. And there was. And when I went back there, he asked me for a ring. Uh, he, well, he didn't ask me for a ring, but he asked me for a piece of metal that was on me all the time. He's like, do you have a key or anything like that? I was staying at this douchey place, so I didn't have to have a key to get in. I had a fob, you know, to get into my, uh, to get into my apartment, and that was it. But uh, in hindsight, that's probably why I was, like, really struggling there. I didn't have my feet on the ground, like, ever. Um, but he, this was the first time that I had ever been to a medium. This was the first time that I had ever been to a medium. And I gave him my grandmother's ring and he just, he held the ring. He said, please let me speak this clearly. And he told me, I'm going to cry when I hear this. But he was like, he was like, look, we're usually not allowed to tell you so much about your future, but because you're very close to ending your life, we're going to tell you what your life is going to look like in the future. And this is where my existential depression ended. This is when suicide stopped being an option for me. And this is why I'm training in mediumship now, because this was what ended my existential depression. He said, there's a a person here, his name's Brian. He's about 30 years old. He has a message for you. Well, that was my fiance that died. The message came through very clearly. He said, you will be loved, like so loved. There is a man for you that loves you so much. And this is like a man. This is like a real man. He said, this is not a ball cap and sneakers kind of guy. And and I think by that he meant like, you know, like a douchebag or that this is a man and he understands you. Like he really understands you. He told me a lot more details. I'm just going to tell the ones that are relevant. It would be a 45-minute session if I told you everything. But but he said, you're going to write many, many books. And you're going to change many, many lives. And you have two children, he said. Two children. He said, I can't see uh, what their like genders are. But you're, you're going to have two children. And, and once you have these children, like the, your whole career is going to change. It's going to be a lot more focused in like children's education and, and renovating the children's education system. But money is never going to be a problem for you. And this is what your life is going to look like. And that's a short version. And baby, I just cried and cried and cried and cried. I just cried and cried. And, uh, and I'm so happy that I came across this because I'm living this now. But I'm so happy that I came across this psychic because and this article about Melissa and Doug, because yeah, a hundred percent, that's what I had is existential depression without a shadow of a doubt. That's what I had ex- existential depression. But if this is something that you struggle with, go look for a medium, look online, like medium, psychic medium, look up hashtag psychic medium, find a medium that you vibe with. Um, I'm taking a mediumship course with a woman named Mary Greasy, G-R-I-S-E-Y. Uh, that's her Instagram name is at Mary G-R-I-S-E-Y. And hopefully soon I'll be able to offer this for people as well. I know that her books aren't always open. This is not an ad. It's just like, I didn't know this, that, that this person was a medium, you know, the sign said Mina the psychic. So I went to see other psychics hoping to talk to some dead people or some of my guides or something again. But this is what you're looking for is a medium. You want to talk to somebody, a loved one or an ancestor or someone that knows the language that you specifically speak. Somebody that like when the medium says, I have this person here, you're like, oh my God, I connect. I, I, I recognize this person and, um, and, you, and you'll trust them because they're obviously touching something that used to be in the seen world and is now in the unseen world. And, and, and this is what you're, you're looking for. But this is where suicide stopped being an option for me because I never saw the point of my existence or the purpose of my existence. Someone had to show it to me, but the second it was shown to me, it ended. So I really, really hope that 
if you uh, that that you really consider taking these alternative routes to healing, like one of the best pieces of advice I ever gotten was like, because therapy wasn't working. And I went to see a psychic named TC Izell in New York. Uh, and he's also a great psychic as well. Very, very talented. The first fourth way teacher, one of my first teachers, but he said, maybe therapy is not for you. He said, maybe therapy isn't for you. And it was like, wow, like really, really, really clicked for me. Um, but these alternative methods, if you can put your trust in them, if you can get over the fear of other people think like maybe you are woo woo, maybe you are here to wear fucking crazier outfits, you know, maybe you are here to not be one of them. Maybe you're here to not be normal. Maybe you're here to try some fucking harebrained idea, you know, that, that where someone's like, maybe you should try clearing all the childhood trauma out of your chakras instead of going to therapy. Maybe you should try this. Like, I hope that me telling you my story here might, might put a little bit of faith in these systems for you because I'm telling you my life is better now than I ever thought that it could, that it, that it could be. But I could not see that vision for myself. It was not possible for me to see that vision for myself. So I will always and forever be grateful to that Nina the Psychic for showing me a vision that I couldn't yet see for myself because I for real owe my life to that. I for real owe my life to that. And after that, I went and got the numbers 501 tattooed on my head because in the book, The Women Who Run With The Wolves, um, Clarissa Pinkle and Estes said that like a woman, a woman's psyche is like a desert that stretches for 500 miles and you're just crawling on your hands and knees so thirsty, so dead and you just fall in the sand ready to die because all you can see around you is more desert and more desert and most women just give up here but if you can be that woman that goes 501 miles just one more mile baby just one more mile I know that life has hurt you so much. I know that it has hurt you so much for so long. But just because your life has hurt you, just because your life has hurt for this long doesn't mean it's always going to hurt this much. Just because it's always been this way doesn't mean it's always going to be this way. You need different tools. You need stronger tools than other people. But you can do this and you will do it. And I promise that once you're on the other side of it, that suicide's not gonna be an option for you anymore. And when it's just not an option to quit life anymore, that's when you really start living. So I wish that for you. I wish that for you, Melissa, and uh, and everyone else in the world. So uh, my name is Onami, and I am teaching a workshop on how to remove childhood, all the trauma from the chakras, objectively. Uh, this is a way of going this is a way of handling all of your inner child work potentially in one day. And if you are interested in teaching this method and having a career and helping others heal, I teach a longer teacher training, which is the same method where you heal yourself a little bit more slowly, but you learn how to heal others the same way and how to charge for that skill so that you can save other people's lives a psychic a seer a visionary you cannot give your work away for free because people won't listen to you i had to spend that 120 dollars at the psychic i had to but because of that for 120 dollars depression my existential depression ended. Suicide was no longer an option for me. So I wish that for all of you. You can find my work at onamihouse.com. Onami, O-N-A-M-I, house, like a house that you live in.